Welcome back. In The Clash tonight, it's five years since the Brexit vote that changed everything. We have since been through two general elections, endless failed Brexit deals and votes, and then, when the deal was finally done, we were struck down by a global pandemic. Today, surveys show the UK is still as split on Brexit as it was at the time. But we have more freedom now over our trade, over immigration and our laws. That's what the majority of Brits voted for, taking back our democratic rights. So, is Brexit the greatest thing to ever happen to the UK? Or, as the Project uh, Fair leaders thought, a total disaster? Arguing Brexit was brilliant is leader of the Reform UK Party, which was, of course, formerly the Brexit Party, Richard Tice. And arguing for Remain tonight, I'm joined by the former MP, Antoinette Sandback, who was one of 21 Tory MPs who had their whip withdrawn after rebelling against the government by voting for opposition MPs to control the parliamentary process to try to prevent a no-deal Brexit. Following uh, the Edisbury Conservative Association passed a motion of no confidence on her and Antoinette chose to become a Liberal Democrat. She lost her seat to the Conservative candidate in the 2019 election. We're also joined by media commentator and author Paul Conyu, a staunch Remainer. Uh, Paul is co-author on four books about Boris Johnson's handling of Brexit and a regular columnist for The New European. He has forecasts that the public will eventually come to feel betrayed by Brexit. Great to have all three of you here. So, Richard Ty, seeing you're slightly outnumbered, let's start with you. Is Brexit the best thing to ever have happened to Britain? Look, Dan, it is fantastic. I mean, it's a huge, huge opportunity. We've taken back control. We're in charge of our destiny, our sovereignty. It's hard to believe. It's literally five years ago now that we're just half an hour left in the polls. I was confident. I was one of the few Brexiteers who was confident that we would win. Uh, Nigel was having a bit of a wobble. Uh, but, and, and sure enough, we won that great Sunderland roar. And it was a huge moment. On one hand, it feels like yesterday. On the other hand, it feels like a lifetime ago with all the grief, the pain, the noise, the arguments, and so on. But we've now got to look forward. Let's use this anniversary as a moment, Dan, to look forward and say, let's unite, let's grasp the opportunities, and let's put the foot flat on the accelerator of growth, of Great Britain. We can be so optimistic. Of course, COVID has been an absolute horror show for all of us. But the best way to get out of it is to say we've got to go for growth and, and, and that's our opportunity to add. Um, I'm, you know, of course we've got challenges, but I think the opportunities far, far outweigh the challenges. And you know, there are issues, of course, with Northern Ireland, with fishing, where frankly, you know, Boris, uh, he, he essentially sold those two areas down the river. Um, and we've got to resort that and they're really important. I'm not in any way uh, de denying that. But overall, you know, I think we've got a great opportunity. I'm bullish. Antoinette Sandback, five years ago tonight, I presume you thought there was no chance Remain was going to lose. No, I wasn't in that in that position actually. Having um, campaigned, I was I was really concerned that Remain were going to lose. And I felt it was very close. So I can't say that I was surprised by the result. I felt that uh, many people who supported Remain took the position for granted in a way and thought they were going to win. But I, I, I think it's too early to tell whether or not um, it is a success. I agree with Richard Tice that we need to make the most of the opportunities but I think we have a deeply divided Britain. I think we've given a boost to Scottish nationalism and, uh, and the SNP and their divisive agenda. And we are seeing the rise of sectarianism in Northern Ireland, which was predicted during the election campaign. And I think one of the real dangers about Brexit is that we risk a very real breakup of the UK. Yes, there may be opportunities, but they've not been delivered yet. And as Daisy on your panel said, it's too early to tell. Antoinette, obviously the loss for the Remain side changed your life. Uh, you lost your political career. You left the Conservative Party. 
Was that worth it? Or do you feel, looking back, that it would have been better immediately after the vote to just accept that Brexit was going to happen and let's make the best of it? I did accept immediately after the vote that Brexit would happen. And in fact, I voted for the deal more times than Boris Johnson did. What I didn't accept was that a no-deal Brexit was what, was what was argued for during the campaign. And I maintain that a no-deal Brexit would, would have been a disaster for the UK. We are seeing huge amounts of increases in red tape facing our, our businesses. I've got loads of businesses, small businesses here in Cheshire, who are facing barriers that, that, that they never faced before. We've lost massive amounts of our uh, services access into Europe. About 80% of our tax take comes from our service industry. And we have lost, for example, access to £8 billion a day sh share in, in euro trading um, because we're unable to, the deal did not um, reach mutual equivalence. I accepted Brexit. I would have liked to have seen a closer relationship with Europe, a much softer Brexit along the lines of EFTA. We set up EFTA when we were going into Europe. And lots of people who I know who voted for Brexit said they were very happy being in the common market. What they didn't like was the greater Euro European integration with the euro. And I think we could have negotiated a much better deal that would have kept us in the common market, but kept us out of that greater integration. But Richard, the, the, the key argument, though, in terms of the negotiations is that the reason why no deal had to be left on the table is because otherwise we were never going to get a deal. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I'm a businessman and unless you're prepared to walk away, you will end up with a bad deal. And that was David Cameron's fundamental flaw in his negotiations before the referendum. It was quite obvious he wasn't prepared to walk away. It was quite obvious Theresa May was not prepared to walk away. So they both got really bad deals and ultimately, thankfully, they got rejected. And, you know, there's a couple of things that have really struck me. I was, I was literally stopped on the street last week by a Remain voting civil servant from one of the main uh, officers of state. And he said, Richard, we don't know each other, but thank you, because Brexit has opened up opportunities that we in the civil service, we didn't realise. We can now actually think things do things, brainstorm things, can, you know, sort of consider the, 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 the stuff that you just couldn't previously uh, think about. And I thought that was, a, was one of the most extraordinary conversations where he said, thank you, it's going to be good for Britain. And that was really powerful. And the other thing I just want to sort of flag is, you know, you had Project Fear and you talked about it earlier, Dan. I'll just give you a couple of examples. You've got Nissan's £400 million new uh, Qashqai uh, plant and investment. You've got, um, you've got uh, down in Filton in Bristol, you've got, uh, you've got the Air Airbus £40 million research centre just opened with government investment. And then finally, my favourite, sweets, Haribo's. Over £20 million invested in Castleford in a new Haribo factory. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> Well, Paul Conyu from the New European, let me bring you in because you think voters are going to get some serious remorse over this decision, don't you? Yes, but let me let me correct you on one thing, Dan. I'm I was rather an exception. I was a rare, staunch Remainer pundit who did predict Leave would win the 2016 referendum after doing my own rather crude DIY research and polling and the. Labour, Heartlands, North and Midlands that I felt were going to be crucial in that decision. And I was never, all never three been as unhappy to be, thought be right were going to win. Well, no, good. I mean, look, I didn't. I, I didn't see it coming. I'll, 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 I'll admit that much. So, so good on you, Paul. You, you had the finger on the pulse. But, but you but, think that's going to turn against be, Brexit, be right. though. Well, what's interesting is, is that... I've been back regularly to, or fairly regularly to, you know, to my research database, of, particularly of the Leave voters, and about half now say they regret uh, their vote to Leave and wouldn't repeat it if there was another referendum. I'm not advocating a, in the near future a second referendum, but but that is their feeling, and it's particularly among the under 45, especially those with children. 
uh, at school or university, uh, who also fear for their kids' future and for their own jobs, and uh, you know, and and they're the ones who have shifted. The over sixties are solidly still Brexiteers at heart, and nothing is going to change their view. But the changing social demographic, age demographic, is going to, I think, by the end of the decade, you might well have pressure, real pressure, for a, a revisit, either a second referendum or certainly a rewriting of the current of the current agreement to bring us closer to, Paul, to the EU. Paul, what you don't seem to be taking into account at all is the pandemic and the fact that the entire country saw that the way that we got vaccinated so much faster than any of our European neighbours is because we weren't come part on, come of on, this Dan. cumbersome come on, Dan. European well, that's, that's medicines agency. It lo- well, it's my line. line. It made the world a difference. We had a choice. Been a great success, but there was nothing that would have prevented a UK government that was still in the EU from well, why didn't Germany do that? Why didn't the France deals that, do that? We, that we did on vaccine? And Richard Tice, it's, let's it's just a, remember for one Boris second. It's another Boris Johnson lie in Parliament. Well, no, 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 because Paul, we let's just remember for one moment. Keir Starmer, the Labour Party leader, was critical of the fact that we were withdrawing from the European Medicine Agency, Richard Tice. So if we were still part of He was of critical EU, of it. He, he was critical of it. But the fact remains that we, we were not barred from actually doing our own deals on vaccine no, but, by, but you know, Paul, by being a member of the EU. It, it, it's true. Richard Simply Price, not you true. Respond. Look, the evidence is absolutely crystal clear. Not one, not one of the other 27 member states was able to take control of their own vaccine programme. Indeed, Germany and a couple of others had started to get themselves organised and they were basically bullied and cajoled into going into the overall negotiation and what a shambles that was literally Brexit Rich, Richard, has saved I, Richard, I agree thousands of on, lives and Deen Sahawi's confirmed it today. It. And that's a fantastic thing. But we've got now, we've got to look forward uh, and focus on the opportunities. And I think, I, I just don't agree with, with, well, I'm interested in your anecdotes, Paul. It's not the anecdotes that I'm getting from people on the street, but I guess that's the nature of anecdotes, isn't it? I think people have very clearly said, it's done, let's move on. And in 10 years' time, frankly, the EU will have so many massive problems, I don't think anybody would even want to have a referendum, let alone vote for it. Antoinette, don't, not a, don't you not, feel... It's not, it's, not, it's not done, despite get Brexit done, the election... It is done, we've Mantra, left! We are only just starting, you know, we're in year one. Of Antoinette, can tricky... I just bring Antoinette in on the, on the vaccine rollout? Because... For me, I think this will spark a fundamental change of opinion amongst Remainers. Do you disagree? I I absolutely agree that Britain's vaccine rollout has been a huge success, but I also agree with Paul that we would have had that choice had we remained in. And unlike Richard, I have faith that the British government would not have allowed itself to have been bullied into joining the EU27, but would have said, if we were still part of the EU, that we would have uh, carried on with our vaccine programme and we prefer to take that in-house as we were. And, and that we, ha- we, would, we would have had that choice whether we were in or, in or out. Um, the EMA was actually based in the UK. It had a huge amount of jobs here and we had a massive amount of uh, life science skills which supported our vaccine effort and the development of the vaccine precisely because the European Medicines Agency was based in the UK. But that's it's now but, moved to Amsterdam. But Antoinette, There's that's... no doubt about it. The government has made a huge success of it, and, and I agree with that. But unlike Richard, I say that the, we would have had the faith, the government would have had the ability and did have the ability and would have withstood uh, pressure from the EU to join that. But seriously, seriously, do you, do you uh, really I think, think do you really think, with the European Medicines Agency here in the centre of London, medicines. do you really think, with the EMA I, 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 based here in London, that we would have been able to say, actually, we've got the the EMA here, but we're going to ignore them, we're going to go and do our own thing, and they sitting in London have got to negotiate. It just wouldn't have happened. It's a nonsense. It's, it's a nice story, but it just wouldn't have happened. 
Well, well I agree with Andrew. I, believe with Andrew on that. I, think... I have greater faith in this country um, than you do, Richard, and I know perfectly well that we have at many times have stood up to Europe and fought for our own rights. Right. And Mrs Thatcher was a very good example of that. So unlike you, I do think we would have um, struck our own path on that. What, what, I, what worries me is that our closest trading partner that had 45% of our trade, small businesses that relied on good access to the single market are really suffering. And what I'm hearing is that they are having to set up warehousing and create jobs in Europe rather than here in the UK because of the difficulties that they're having exporting to the EU and the non-tariff barriers that they're facing and the additional costs in terms of the cost of customs paperwork and the costs of um, particularly all yes, the regulations I, around I, 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 food. And that there's been a huge failure to agree mutual recognitions of uh, of our standards, okay. both in uh, services and the food sectors that are really causing damage to the UK economy. We don't want to agree some of this stuff. We want to have the opportunity to deregulate, particularly in financial services. The last thing we want is to be tied into uh, the, the, the huge restrictions. You know, the City of London, we should be scrapping the burdensome MIFID II regulations. Our competitors with the City of London is with New York, it's with Asia, it's not with Frankfurt, it's not with Paris. Trade and and, deal and thank, heavens, thank heavens we're out and we need to deregulate and deregulate fast so that we can become a high growth, low tax economy, creating higher wages and higher skills. And it's, it's a massive, massive opportunity. We've got to go for it. Paul, I just want to have a final word yeah. on Project FAIR because I spoke about it in my digest tonight. Do you now concede that the lies that were told by officials throughout Project FAIR, and remember it included the, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the time, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, do you concede that that has done serious damage in terms of the trust that the British people have with the people leading them? There were, there were lies, certainly, you know, from the remains from the remain side, but there were also very big, very big lies from the Leave side, including by Boris Johnson's Sphinx board, of course, by Dominic Cummings. Um, and where, without doubt, the success of the vaccine rollout and get Brexit done has given Boris Johnson a big poll boost at times, and currently still has. But I suspect the truth is now coming out about the real costs of Brexit rather than the fantasies of bre Brexit. And I think Boris Johnson's Teflon coating is okay. st I understand just you starting like about Boris, to but I'm talking peel, about Project peel away. Antoinette, final word to you. Project Fear, it was a huge mistake. Do you now concede that the British public was lied to? No, I don't, I don't concede that the British uh, public were lied to. I think we're not enforcing in this country a lot of the uh, barriers to EU goods coming in. We're actually undercutting our own producers here and our producers are facing unfair competition from Europe because we are not enforcing what okay, the European no, Union but, but are it, There was no us. recession, I, 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 unemployment didn't soar to 500,000, employment actually doubled. No. I mean, these were lies. Well, Dan, the troubles well, in Northern well, Ireland now had, are largely down had, to the lies Boris Johnson had, told them. No, no, but, but, but I'm talking about project. No, we've, we've, had, we've, had a, we've had a transition period. We've had a, a deal that has been negotiated, but it's going to go on, as Paul said, for years. It's not concluded. And... For me, the very real risk and concern that I had was around the integrity of the UK. And I think we're only going to see in the long term the impacts of the rise of nationalism, both in Ireland and the sectarian approach that we're seeing happening in Northern Ireland, um, which is deeply concerning, but also the risks around a further referendum in, in Scotland. And if there's a border poll in Northern Ireland uh, caused by the... Uh, undermining of the protocol, uh, which which supported the Good Friday Agreement, and I very much hope that the protocol isn't undermined, then 
I think that, that if, if there's a border poll, there's a real risk that there may well be a united Ireland, which would then uh, give the nationalists in Scotland a real boost. And I'm somebody that believes... So your charge is that Brexit great Britain, could still that, result in the end of the union? Yes. Yeah. And that's and not will forget, be two out of four so nations so of the UK... Earlier question, remain. I don't oh. regret the stance that I took on no deal... And, but I also agree with Paul that the younger generation who are used to freedom of movement, freedom of travel, the ability to work across 27 EU countries and those small business, businesses that started within the last 20 years who have only known uh, what life was like in the single market, I think there will be a call to renegotiate. Not now. By all means, let's take the opportunities and see what they deliver. But I fear... It won't be the sunlit uplands that we were promised. <laughs> OK, thank you so much.